Once again, good morning. If I was your pilot, I would say to you that uh, we're in for some turbulent weather, and I'd suggest that you keep your seatbelts buckled. Um, I've discovered once again that uh, what I'm going to be sharing with you today is like reading a book, and as you pick this book up, you, you read the introduction, and I realized that actually this could turn into a wonderful weekend seminar, and um, I think that great reconciliation can happen through it. But what I want to do today is for us to recognize where do we live, how do we live, and so... Um, The title of my message is, Are You an Overcomer or a Victimite? Are you an overcomer or are you a victimite? And so there's these fancy diseases that you get. What are they? What are those itises, Trish? The viticulitis? What are litis? So are you an overcomer or are you a victimite? And... Um, what I want to start off with is that you need to know it's your responsibility to understand the providence of God, the sovereignty of God, and how God rules over your life. It's in conversations that I've felt that I needed to preach this message, because when I listen to people's language, they don't realize that they are actually victimites. And a victimite is predominantly life happening to me. And so when you look at a victimite's language, we look at some of that, it's predominantly living out of your human reasoning. It's still living in an adamic way where there's a new way to live in the kingdom of God. And so the sovereignty of God has this in it, and you must understand this. If you don't understand this, you'll interpret the whole Bible incorrectly, and that is that God does nothing, nothing but for the glory of his name. For his name's sake, he does everything. And so everything he does is for your worship and your enjoyment of God, not your betterment. But in your worship and enjoyment of God, the betterment of your life will come to you. But here is another thing. When I listen to Christians praying, Christians believe that God is reading the newspaper on what's happening on the end times. All of a sudden, they get stuck. stuck. They shout and they say, God's coming help. God drops the newspaper. Hey, what's happening? What did you say? And so I need to pray 15 times because God was distracted. That is not the God of the Bible. I need your support today. You need to be verbal. The God of heaven and earth, the God of the Bible, is sovereign over all things. All seeing, all knowing, all powerful. And you, one thing you need to realize there's nothing in your life, past, present, future, that God is not aware of and possibly even causing. Good and bad. Now, recently I was in Cape Town packing my vehicle to, to bring Trish back home, and my leg hooked in the tow bar. And the next thing, as I was getting off, my leg didn't come out, so I fell back and, shh, and I did some damage to myself. Was that God? No. But God works together for the good of those who love him and called according to his purpose. And so the whole key to the sovereignty of God in your life is the meaning you give to what's happening. But if I start thinking... Did a demon push me? And so in, in, in spiritual warfare, you get those, there's a demon behind every bush. Then you get those, there's no demons. 
but the devil works in the middle. He loves to push us to the extremes, but what's happening in the middle? And so my question to you is, are you living from this sovereignty of God, the providence of God? In other words, are you responding to the fact that God is already there? So the providence of God has in it, when you do a word study of the word, it is God has seen to it. And so many of us have learned the word Jehovah Jireh, God provides. Yes, he does. But it's not in response to our help God. God's already there. God's already provided the solution. But the problem is with victimites, because life is happening to them, God is distracted, God's not there, God didn't stop me from falling, wara, 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 wara. They don't live in the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, to be an overcomer, to get a breakthrough from God, you've got to be curious. And to be curious, you need to be listening, not speaking as if you know. We'll look at some of those things. Let's go through some of the Bibles. Does the Bible say anything about these things? So if we go to 1 John 5 verse 5, which is my opening scripture, who is he who overcomes the world, but he or she who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, there's a whole teaching. What does it mean that Jesus is the Son of God? Whole different teaching. Because Ephesians 4 verse 21 says, and it talks about how we lived incorrectly, but it says, but if indeed you have heard him, Jesus, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And so the only place you're going to find meaning to your life is in Christ. Trish and I were listening to a YouTube clip. It was an ex-FBI agent, and they were talking about what's happening in the Middle East. And they said, there's a new, new reality on the earth that we need to become aware of, which is another reason why I want to preach the sermon today, is you need to know that reality is being created by YouTube. Everybody on their cell phone, from their perspective, is putting a narrative out there that is teaching you what is reality. That narrative is being controlled by rich people who want to take over this world. They have to because God said it's going to happen. They're not this ingenious stuff because God is coming to a place where he's coming to fetch his bride and to destroy his enemies. But you don't want to be on the wrong side. Victor Martitz could get you on the wrong side of the fence. And I'll show you how through the scriptures. And so who overcomes the world? He who believes that Jesus Christ is the son of God and is taught by him and believes that the only truth is in Jesus Christ. So are you working from divine providence or are you living your own drama? Drama just means you've made meaning of things out of your own understanding. Now, something that we need to understand is God has given you the ability to give meaning to life. That meaning has come by you watching patterns starting from the moment of conception, the way you were conceived, from what you learnt in the womb, right up until you are glorified, you go to be with the Lord. You are always making meaning of life. If I had the time, I would bring three people up here and I'd get them to describe what they see in the room. And we would see that they all see different things of course, they pick on different things because different things are important to them. And so the reality, we can say the room is speaking to them. That's life happening to me. And that's how we've been learned to live. We've been learning to live. The room speaks to me. The room gives me meaning. No, no. You give meaning to the room. And so things happen to us. Life sucks sometimes. When you leave your foot in a tow bar, and it decides to separate itself, sometimes like the church likes to do. And you land flat on your back, and the first thing that comes to your mind, after pride comes a fall. (laughs) 
Fortunately, I wasn't looking around. I was wondering, is my head okay? Am I okay? But hang on, my foot's still stuck. So let's, let's look at what does is, what is the divine providence of God sound like out of Scripture? Isaiah 46 verse 9, the New King James Version. Remember the former things of old. So he's saying to us, um, and so what leaders need to do, because we're going to look at, the, at three different characters, but what leaders need to be able to do, and in everything that God is doing to his leaders, he wants you to be able to process your past, he wants you to manage your reality, and he wants you to be preempting the future. Those are also three brain activities that we are able to do as a gift of God. Remember the former things of old? For I am God, and there is no other. Man without God, for I am God. So if you live drama, you are God. Man without God. I'm God and there is none like me. I'm sorry, you cannot compete with him. I'm God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. Hello. How come God now all of a sudden has to drop the newspaper and find out what's going on in your life when God has already seen what's going to happen in your life? And nine times out of ten, God has warned you, but you're so busy in the victimitis mindset that you're not listening. Who are the sons of God? Those that are led by the Spirit of God. But the victimitis, we're so used to blaming, complaining, that we're not listening. Because why? We love the sound of our own chunking. I don't know what's an English word for that. Declaring the end from the beginning. We look at the beginning and we start trying to make work. We, we work backwards. But there's something that I've noticed about God that is absolutely magnificent. When God calls you, God knows what he's going to make you and God knows what he's going to get you to, to, to do. But we're trying to find our way, fight this way, do this way, create ourselves. We get to 72 years of age and we all find it. Actually, it doesn't quite manage. I need you to reshape me, God. I've made the wrong meaning of life. Declaring the end from the beginning. From ancient times, things are not yet done. What are we seeing happening today? Prophecy coming true. Say, my counsel shall stand. God's counsel over your life shall stand. But we must get into step with that counsel. God doesn't come into step with us. God's not a victimitis. And so my counsel shall stand. I will do my pleasure. The noun providence comes to mean act uh, purposefully and providing for and governing for people. So when we understand the kingdom... God rules over us sovereignly to rule over us, but God also provides for us in the kingdom where Western uh, law courts misrepresent the kingdom of God. Let's look at 1 John 5, verse 3 to 5. It says, for this, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. And so it's immediately addressing us, this is the love of God. How do you know you love God? You're obedient. And immediately he attacks the victim and he says it's not burdensome. And so the church says, it's hard. But you don't understand. You don't live my life. But for this is love, for this, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. What is our faith? Who Jesus is, what Jesus is saying, what Jesus is doing. And, and, and how we believe. That's the most important thing about you. And then verse 5. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus Christ is Lord? So in other words, your faith, everything about you, everything you're becoming, everything you're going to do, is centered on who Christ is. 
Much of my teaching today uh, uh, has, uh, I want to honor him and also not be caught guilty of plagiarism, is a guy by the name of Jim Clemmer. He's part of the Clemmer group, if you want to. Uh, you can just put that in there and you'll get to his site and there's huge amounts of, of information on it. It's a secular leadership group, um, but a very successful uh, speaker, written many books, but he also partners with a company, uh, a leadership group called Zinger and Falkman. And these people will um, put, they'll take 175,000 leaders and put them through uh, computer programs, and then they will come up with what works. And so a very proven, very successful way. But what I did is I took the teachings that I, that, that I was listening to him, which is what I do with all of my stuff that I'm uh, preparing. And so I've made a decision. I don't want to get old. I want to grow old. And so if I'm not growing faster than Keith, then I'm busy dying. But my growth is also Keith's growth. What about you? And so I asked somebody one day, why do you, do you read? And that person said, no. And I said, do you know why I read? So he said, no. So I said, so I can help you. He said, I can live with that. That person's reading today. <laughs> That's why you read. So here's a question. And this comes from Jim Clemmer. And so now you need to picture a bus stop. And so if I could have three chairs up here. Devon, won't you come and help me, please? Your wife has volunteered you this morning. I had this wonderful interaction this morning, and I went over there, and um, this couple really just brought meaning to them. Liesl was there, and, uh, and so what we're going to be looking at is we're going to look at, are you a victim? Are you a persecutor? Are you a rescuer? Another way we can say that, are you a wallower? Are you a follower, or are you a leader? Why don't you put them on the stage for us, please? Thank you. And so this is a bus stop. And on this bus stop is three people, also three brain activities. And so our brain has many functions. This is brain, a brain surgery for dummies. And so the brain is able to problem solve. Thanks, Devon. You might as well come and sit. <laughs> your wife volunteered. Sorry, what your wife says, guys. And you can decide whether you... Eh? Okay, so sit next to Keith there so long so he can pray for you because you're going to need it. <laughs> and so the brain can problem solve. The brain can read the room and the brain has a history. When you work out of your history, there's no learning. There's only fight, flight. In other words, must I run, must I hide, must I fight? And if it's really bad, you faint. Trish one day had to remove a boil pip out of my hand. She fainted. I don't know what, what one it was that was operating in it. But so we'd have a look and see. This would be a leader. This would be a follower. And this one would be a wallower. Now, his wife says he's a wallower. I didn't say so. So, won't, Devon, won't you come and sit as a waller? I was there. Hey, you were there. Oh, yes. Liesl, come, come and help me up, please. And so this is how this conversation went down. Lisa. No, 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 no I didn't ask you to sit. No, 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 you must come and demonstrate. You, you must come up here. Stand up here with me. And so what I was saying is that, um, what's her name? Um, Lilani, the Lani lady, yeah, I'm going to call you Lilani. The Lani lady offers her husband as the victim, so I said, um, so that means Lani must be the persecutor. He says, you got it, so why don't you come and sit here as well? Sir? <laughs> but then Liesl stands in, uh, and I, okay. Liesl standing there, and I, I said something, and she said, I'm an innocent bystander. So how did you do that? Why don't you demonstrate that fancy move there? So why don't you sit on the other chair, please? So it's a little bit changed around. Okay. So I th uh, why not? Would you like to vacate the seat? What? 
<laughs> okay, she's. You've got an upgrade, but. And so. So here's three people sitting at the bus stop. At this bus stop, there's a different way that you process. And so you can process as man without God, or you can process in the sovereignty of God or the providence of God. And so we've got a leader who initiates. We've got a follower who's waiting to see what's going to happen. And we've got somebody, hmm, who has victimitis. So he's, he's, he's got broad shoulders. He's, take, he's actually taking the bullet for everybody. Well done, dear. You're a picture of Jesus. But one thing, and so he, he has this analogy, and he asks us a couple of questions. and says, are you in the front line at the bus stop? And so, are you in the front line of, at the bus stop as a wallower? Are you at the front line at the bus stop waiting to see what's going to happen? Or are you a leader that's going to initiate something? What they've discovered is most people are followers and wait for somebody else to show the way or help them decide how to feel or respond. Anybody recognize that? I think we need to realize that all three of these characters are in us, otherwise you don't have a brain. But it's your choice how you're going to live. But the problem is, when you've got to this stage, you are overwhelmed. You have been taken captive. So this bus is got two destinations. On this side, it has a better city. Sorry, yeah, um, that it, it has, you can catch a better bus or you can catch the bitter bus. This is Jim Clemens and narrative, not mine. And so he says, maybe you, and then this bus, this bitter bus, is it on its way to Pity City. <laughs> Why are you smiling? <laughs> hey? There we go. <laughs> there we go. Wife's recognizing the good things in you. Maybe you know a few people who live in Pity City, the Wallows. And so he says he was doing a workshop one day, and when he was talking about Pity City, the one woman stood up and she said, I want to tell you, my husband's the mayor of it. <laughs> my husband's the mayor of it. <laughs> and Pity City, Pity City has a suburb called Frown Town. It can be a therapeutic place to visit. Uh, sometimes we need some recovery time. Uh, we may need to grieve, uh, to ventilate our frustrations and be corrected by leadership and to help us with our setbacks. But you don't want to live in this toxic place. If you live in Pity City, your residency leads to deepening citizen, cynicism, despair, and inaction. Thank you. Glad you approve. This is not leadership territory. But it's so easy to get on the bitter bus, rolling down the hopeless highway to Pity City, because that's where many people are going. You want me to read that again? It's easy to get on the bitter bus, rolling on, rolling on down the helpless highway to pity city so you can wallow, because that's where so many people are going. But everybody's doing it. 
Everybody's saying it. It's okay. I must say, I have the most attractive props and the most handsome. What we need to be careful of, wallowers, regularly ride the pity bus, the, the bitter bus. And so John Piper talks about a victim. A victim is not somebody who sees themselves as worthless, but they are ticked off. What does it look like to be ticked off, Lisa? <laughs> Here we go. I can argue. Really? Theo, you understand that look. What does that look mean, Theo? Wow. <laughs> uh, so he's like John Wayne. He can take the highway to Pretty City or where? <laughs> so wallowers routinely ride the bitter bus down helpless highway through Frown Town, past pessim- pessimism place. Mm, are you pessimistic or optimistic? Through the winding way to the dead end drive of Pretty City. Many wallowers drive the bus actively recruiting fence-sitting followers to join them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Come ray Sam. Full yammer for me. What is that guy you always name, Tina Yanni? Yeah, okay. And so Jim Clemmer would talk about Yanni Yammerhat as a guy as having rectinitis. That's his view of the world. And so do you have a dot, dot, dash view of the world? Then you are Yanni Yamakat because you have rectinitis, because you are a victimite. This is not the Bible. I understand that, but it's about fun. I'm trying to create an analogy to get you free and live. And so Romans 8 verse 14 says, for as many are the sons of God that are led by the Spirit of God, sorry, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So the victim, I don't want to hear God now. God doesn't understand. God doesn't understand the reality I've made. But who are the sons of God? Those that are led by the Spirit of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage of pity city again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom you cry out, Abba, Father. Let's look at the drama of the nation of Israel. And so they prefer pity city towards the promised land. Numbers 4 verse 2. And so all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and wept that night. So now my props are going to cry and weep. Who liked that? <laughs> you see, leaders don't cry that much. You know. <laughs> so you'll notice the, the lead, so lead, leaders don't cry as much. But even, you know, it's, it's coming. My, that, but... Hang on, the scripture says, they lifted up their voices and cried. That's not, uh, so who liked it? I want to see that. They want to see that. Come. Divan, yes, yes, fantastic. To base for us. Who liked it as hulle hulle stem is with dik maak en uitskree? How does that look? Yes, please. Who, who votes for Divan? So we want Divan. We want Divan. <laughs> and so they cried and then they wept. And it was a chunk barley, you know? And then all the children, now this is where you come in, and all the children of Israel complained. They complained. Victimitis is a complainer. We don't realize. I want to encourage you. You can share it with a friend. It's okay. 
tape yourself if you tell your story. It's in the language. It's in the language. Do you know that Satan needs you and he needs your mouth? God needs you and God needs your mouth. What your mouth is being used for, you are becoming. By you. The meaning you giving to life, what you expressing out of your mouth as a man believes in his heart, so is he. But you see, the victim wants to blame the leader. And as long as the leader can blame, he doesn't have to take responsibility. He wants God to change the leader, but he doesn't want to change. Because why? He's ticked off, not because he's worthless, but nobody has acknowledged his worth. So when you hear the rectonitis, <laughs> you need to repent. And the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And so, Keith, come and join me. So this is Moses, and this is Aaron. So now he come and complained. I want to tell you, I got the best drama team in the whole world. (laughs) Disneyland, all of those places, you have nothing compared to what we have here. And all the children complain against Moses and Aaron. (laughs) We didn't realize you were that good at complaining. (laughs) And all the children complain against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should become victims? But who's speaking? (laughs) Blow, 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 (laughs) nah. Would it not be better for us to return to Bitter City, to Egypt? How many of us want to go back? How many of us are talking about the good old days? When we, meantime, when you were there, you hated that too. So you see, the Bible is talking about this. Proverbs 23, verse 26, my son, my daughter, give me your heart. Let your eyes observe my ways, for a harlot is a deep pit of the heart. And so this, you need to realize that it's a heart condition. What's in our hearts? And so he says, you need to be careful that you're not seduced to loving something more than God. In this case, sometimes we love complaining more than what we love praising. We sometimes love complaining more than we like thanking. The the seductress is a narrow well. Temptation is a seduction, is the enticement to something amazing, but through the way of disobedience. And the problem with victims, with passive people, with compliance is they very easily make wrong right. The reason being is they have the fear of conflict. So we need to, we need to be care that, careful that we're not enticed to something beautiful through the way of disobedience. Who overcomes the world? The one who obeys his commandments. So also lies in wait for the victim. Aha. Satan has wanted you to create a victimitis through your language because he set a trap for you. She also lies in wait for a victim and then she increases the unfaithful amongst men. 
people who want to catch the bitter bus, who are victims, are always discipling people to join them on their victim journey. You need to understand what I want. No, no. You need to obey God's commands. There's a statement I read. I can't remember the guy's name. You remain true to God in your heart, and he will use the great mind he has given you for his purposes. If your heart is a complaining heart, you cannot expect it to be loyal to God. John Piper says, what is sinning? Sinning is any feeling or thought or speech or action that comes from a heart that does not treasure God over all other things. Complainers of people who are trying to get their needs met in an ungodly way. But repentance is turning to God from all else and valuing and the valuing of God above all else. And so you need to change from being a follower, which we look at just now, to a victim, to become initiating. You need to take personal responsibility. So a complainer doesn't take personal responsibility. A complainer is always holding other people responsible. A complainer has they. Do you remember them? Do you remember them? Let me tell you about them. The New Testament has a beautiful Old Testament example in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 6. And it was God speaking to me about these things that God wants us to address them. Now these things became our examples. To the intent that we should not lust lust after evil things as they also lusted. Where do wars and fights come from? The desires that are within us. Do not become idolaters as some of them, loving something more than God, being enticed to love something more than God, even your kids and your wife, husband, whatever. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us connect, commit sexual immorality, and this once again is loving something, being intimate with something else before we are intimate with God. In other words, uh, an example is if sex is our satisfaction, if we think sex is king of the road, that's immorality. But the reality is the purpose of sex is that we would delight ourselves in God. We'll talk more about that on Saturday. But here's the thing, because of sexual immorality, and so remembering that in the context of us as believers, this is a spiritual immorality. This is a spiritual condition of the heart. It's not necessarily where Jesus says, if I look at a woman, as if I so much look at her, I've already committed the sin. And then look at the consequences. Now we see that in the last days, many will be deceived, many will be taken away. As it says, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. A condition of the heart. Then it says, nor complain as some of them complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. The purpose of the bitter bus on its way to Pity City with the complainer on it is to set you up to the destroyer. The destroyer gets hold of you because of your choices, not because the destroyer is powerful. Satan is a liar. Who who comes to steal, kill, and destroy? False teachers, false prophets. He needs your mouth. But the reality is, when Satan lies to you, he lies to you. That's who he is. The dog was walking me the other day. Life happening to me. And so I'm walking and, that, and, and 
there's some stuff, medical stuff I'm working through at the moment. And so the Holy Spirit says to me, you need to know Satan hates you. Now, a demon's been in my office and told me exactly the same thing. I hate you and wanted to kill me. But it's not who you are, it's who he is. Satan hates you because of who he is. God loves you because of who he is. But you need to have the right meaning to these two things. Satan's hatred for you is not personal. Satan's hatred for you is because of who he is. But Satan needs the opportunity that you give to him through victimitis or following life happening to you. If you don't use the opportunities God gives you, Satan will take the opportunities. He's no rules. So he will lie to you, but he only has you if you believe it. Because you believe it, you now live a lie. It's not because Satan is, but oh, he's a master deceiver. Let's read analogy again. Wallowers routinely ride the bitter bus down the helpless highway through frown town, past pessimism place. And so there's this, it's the end of the year, the new year is coming in. And so how does the pessimist approach the new year? He's standing there. He, 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 he negativizes everything. That's a new English word. You can take it. It's a revelation. And so he's standing there and he's watching the clock to make sure that the old year leaves. But the optimist is standing. What are the new opportunities that God has created in the new year? You guys are right, yeah? How are they responding? Are we doing well? So, we don't get to choose much of what happens to us in this life. We really choose the adverse changes that spring up, but we always choose how to respond or react. Your response, your reaction, your interpretation is the meaning that you're giving to life. But if you can blame me, how many of you believe in evolution? I do. Because you see, people who live in pretty city evolve. (laughs) They don't initiate. Life happening to me. Evolution is not just a theory. It's a fallen lifestyle. Let's, let's face it, life isn't fair. Falling out the back of your motor car with nobody pushing you isn't fair. But it does carry some personal responsibility. I'm now 72 years of age. I was actually reminded by my wife the other day, I said I was 73. She says, you're younger than what you think. <laughs> I think she's worried about being married to an old man. Life certainly isn't fair. fair. We do get to choose what we do about what happens to us. Lots of unfair and unjust rubbish, you can use another word you like, happens to undeserving people. But we know when rectomitis happens and the jam hits the fan, The jam doesn't get spread evenly, and sometimes you land up with more than others. But what are you going to do about it? It's our choice. How are we going to stand this? This is critical to our happiness, our health, and our success. Have you noticed that pain is inevitable, but suffering not? So when you look at the Bible in the book of James, it says that you will be tested. God wants to prove you righteous. 
You will be tempted. Satan wants to prove you unrighteous. When you choose to go with the wallower and to blame, the consequences is suffering. And so many times people will say, the church hurt me. Really? Show me how they hurt you. They said this, that, and the other. But what did you believe? What you believed hurt you. Your victimitis is torturing you. Hebrews 12 verse 13 says, and this is to renew your spiritual vitality. Pursue peace with all people and holiness. Listen to this. Without which no one will see the Lord. Why does he want you to be a victim? Why does he want you to adopt victimitis and rectimitis as a lifestyle? Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. And so the grace of God is not in a victim. I'll read a scripture from Paul, what that looks like. Looking carefully, verse 15, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest the root of bitterness spring up, cause trouble, and many become defiled. You want to go fetch some people and ask them if they want to ride the bitter bus with you? Is scripture speaking to us? You see, Acts 8 verse 20, there was a leader in Zambia the other day, things are happening in his life, and he's an incredibly anointed leader. And I felt this was a strategy. He, he was the person with the anointing and the calling, but something happening in his life was trying to shape this mindset in him. And it says, but Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. And you see, what is the bitter bus got? Buying and selling. You owe me. You owe me. God owes me. The world owes me. I'm entitled. You have neither part nor portion of this matter when that's in you. For the heart is not right in the sight of God. And so the reality, the providence of God is looking in our lives and saying, what do you look like in my sight? I don't care what you think God would say, but it's who I am. Repent, therefore. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness and pray if perhaps the thought of your heart, sorry, I'm going to read that again. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven of you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. The purpose that Satan wants you to live in pity city on the bitter bus is so that you can be bound with iniquity. Christ has set you free. But if you don't change your behavior, if you don't change the way you live, you will be on a pity city bus. Who invented the clock? James 3 verse 14. But if you have bitter envy, in other words, the, the compliant, the, the, the passive, the, the wallower has envy. If you have bitter envy and self-seeking, it's all about me, even if I'm beating myself up or finding fault in myself. If you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. The other scripture says, because the truth is in Christ. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Earthly, sensual, and demonic. That's where he wants you to live. Your choice. And so if you're there, it's your choice that you're there. What, what 
I don't like this idea, but it's true. I'm exactly the way I've wanted to be. Because of the meaning I've made to life and how I'm going to live my life. But then Christ saved me. And so once Christ saved me, I need, what's Christ trying to do? He's getting the world out of me and he's putting the kingdom in me. But the problem is if I have victimitis, I want to hold on to a crutch. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there, Satan's saying to you, I'm looking for an opportunity. So I, you know what I love doing? And I, I dare you to do this. I walk into a shop and they say to me, um, how can we help you? Then I say, well, I don't want to complain because if I complain, you're going to make money out of me. So recently, I dropped Sally at the airport. Somebody walked past my bucky. They broke the mirror off. I came back and I saw my mirror was broken. They had to have the mirror replaced. I had to stand there and purpose and choose. Because I knew every evil thing was waiting there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield to God, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality. Do you know that sometimes we look at the conflict in the Middle East, there's Israel and there's, let's say, the Arab countries. And so we look there and we say, God's like choosing Israel over the Arab countries. No, he isn't. God's choosing himself. God's going to act in that situation because of who God is, not because of who Israel is or who the Arabs are. God's going to be faithful to who he is in presenting himself in that fight. But you see, when it comes to Trish and I, Trish and I land up in a, in a conflict. Then I think, well, God, and, and so we, Trish, she's read the Psalms. I'm not a Psalms person. I'm a Proverbs person. I need wisdom. And so Trish will pray like David, get him God, kill him God, slaughter him God. <laughs> and then she gets to the juicer. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay, God, I repent. Save him, God. Make Christ form him. She used to pray like that. That's why I am where I am today. Ephesians 4, verse 17. I'm going to go a little bit over time today. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their minds, having their understanding darkened. What is the purpose of the, of the, of the follower and the victimitis? Is that your understanding be darkened? But it's because you're working from envy, envy, envy is I'm the judge, where the kingdom of God, Christ, is the judge. Verse 19, who being past feeling, although victimites are all about feelings, just used to say feelings are neither right or wrong. I say, woman, get a life. It's a choice. Uh, then she's, the other day she comes to me and says to me, you like a plank with a nose. So I said, what do you mean I'm a plank like a No, you don't have feelings. Okay, well done. I'll introduce myself, the plank with a nose. So I said to her, what you don't realize is I'm a compliant. I'm a passive. I'm socially acceptable. I don't voice my feelings. I don't tell everyone. I suppress my feelings. But man, I'm like a volcano on the inside. I'm like a landmine. People say to me, who can it with you? Who can it with you? Say, I guess was a landmine. Moet net nie op my trap nie. But you see, then you get those people. In a, in a marriage, you will find that there's a persecutor and there's the victim. The persecutor goggles with gunpowder and shoots the mouth off. You see, persecutors couldn't care to hoots about you, but they just want you to know how they think and feel. And if they sort of like the fan the stuff, the poop eats the fan. And so if the poop eats the fan, when they explode, well, that's just you standing in the wrong place. 
He says, being past feelings have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleansingness and greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. For if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man who grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And so Paul would say to us, how does a leader respond? So Paul writes to us in Romans 15, uh, verse 15, he says, Nevertheless, brethren, I've written more boldly to you on some points and reminding you, because of the grace of God given to me, how do you live away from victimitis? You live in the grace of God, according to the, because of the grace of God given to me by God, it's received, it's not earned because of Jesus. The grace of God has extended us. Verse 16, that I, might minister, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ. I've been bought with a price. I'm not my own. I'm not a victim. I'm not an orphan. I'm a son. I'm more than a conqueror because he's overcome the world for us. That I might be a minister of Jesus Christ. And so Satan wants to use your mouth. Jesus wants to move, use your mouth. Who's using your mouth? And you need to know your mouth will be used against God to accuse God. Your mouth will be used against you to accuse you. Your mouth will be used to accuse others. But you need to realize that you will see in, this, in that scripture, um, I might have uh, missed it, um, Ephesians 4, verse 19, um, verse 19 says, who being past feelings have given themselves over. Victimitis means we've given ourselves over. Being a follower, waiting for things to happen. Getting somebody else to make the decision. I'm not going to make the decision. How many of you, when you were at school, when you put up your hand and you were asked a question and you had the right answer, but it wasn't the right answer to the question, and the whole class laughed at you, and the teacher sat down and said, Yanni, you don't know what you're talking about. You're stupid. How many of us had experiences like that? Most of the guys. Because, I mean, we arrive at class, we believe in evolution. When we get there, everything will just fall on our laps. We don't have to open up the books. The women do all the studying. Why must we bother? As long as I can crib from the girl next to me, I'm okay. She's the A student. So I just, I've missed that point when I was saying that. You need to see. So it's not the devil doing it to you. It's you giving yourself over to. So are you giving yourself over? Are you the slave of unrighteousness or are you the slave of righteousness? That I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel, ministering Jesus, the Jesus of God, the Son of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Spirit. What is Paul saying? He says, the, once God saved me, the grace of God, which leaves me with absolute gratitude in worship, the grace of God empowers me to preach the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit purifies and cleans it up, me and the ones that I'm preaching to, that we would be acceptable to God. But what is the pity city bus wanting you to do? He wants you to be rejected because those that live here possibly won't even see God. I want to give you a definition of self-leadership, which comes from a guy by the name of Brynton Cozan. It says, self-leadership is having a developed sense of who you are, what you are, and coupled together with the ability to influence your communication 
Are you in control of your communication? And so what we need to realize is when we think about the future, we engage our front mind. We engage our middle mind to say our reality. But our history comes into it. When we make a decision, these three team up together, and within a nanosecond, second, you come up with your answer. That answer is either loyal to God or loyal to your history. So your, 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 your life needs to be shaped by the Bible and that the truth is in Christ. So it's, you need to influence your communication, your emotions, your behavior on the way of where God is sending to you. And so your emotions are your responsibility. Your emotions are your choice. Your words are your choice. What am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to take responsibility for your life. Because if you don't become responsible for your life, there's a couple of baddies out there that are willing to take over your life without your permission. And God's not going to wrestle you to be your Lord and Savior. God's going to want you to surrender. Who those that overcome the world? It's those that confess that Christ is Lord. I'm way over time. And so, here's the last demonstration. Okay, if I go a little bit over. Okay. So now, these three people are going to be three different steps. So there's one that's wallowing. So you can get down to the bottom, stand on the bottom step. And then you can stand on that one. Liesl's going to stand on the chair. Can I help you up? You're safe? Okay. Okay. We'll put it in, there's a net there if you fall, it's fine. And so I need to make a choice, like a staircase. How am I going to live my life? Am I going to step down from what God has called me to, to wallow? Or am I going to stand and watch? Good stuff. You guys can interact, it's good. Keeps them awake. Because I'm way past their attention span. So we need the acting. Or, you see, wallowers say, they're doing it to me. Followers say, let's wait and see what happens. And so on a Sunday morning, the Bible says to us that we should make the magnificent wisdom of Christ known to the principalities, powers, and readers. Bring a psalm, bring a hymn. Perfect. And so everybody's sitting and saying, let's see if Brian does something. Let's see if so-and-so does something. And I'm not going to get up because why my fear of being rejected, fear of rejection, fear of man, fear of failure, is keeping me in my seat. I'm wallowing. So I'm going to be a follower. I'm going to wait until it happens. But the leader says, how can I capitalize? How can I take what's happening and, and bring about life change? I was at this game the other day, getting some meds for Trish. And I'm standing in the queue minding my own business when the next thing, this lady has a handbag. Let me tell you, I think that thing can carry a corpse. And I tell you what, it must have, a, it probably had some building material because it was so heavy. So she turned around, and as she turned around, she bumped me. And I went flying. And I, immediately I had to make some choices. I went flying into the racks and stuff, falling and everything. And so the lady turns out, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, lady, this is an amazing day. Imagine, I didn't realize it, but I was going to bump into you today. I immediately changed the whole chemist. Whether you were there for a suppository or whether you were there for <laughs> lipstick, you laughed. It's just some people who wear those glasses. They have rectomitis. And so, are you going to wallow? Are you just going to follow? Or are you going to initiate and respond to God's call in your life? So we're going to quickly do a quick list. 
So if you wallow, you're a pessimist. You're a half full person. Like, yeah, what's going to go wrong next? If you follow, you're cynical and you're skeptical. Hmm. If you are leading, you're an optimist. You're looking for opportunities. If you're a wallower, you're negative. If you're a follower, you're neutral. I, I, I don't have an opinion. Of it. I'm not going to say anything in case you reject me. And if you're leading, you're positive. I walked into a place yesterday and I, no, no, leave that one. But too close to the bone. And it's on me, so no. And so if you're wallowing, you are fear-based. You need to realize anger is fear-based. Anger may, may, look, may help you to look powerful and awesome, but you're at your most vulnerable. That's heart attacks, aneurysms, all of those things. So if you're wallowing, you're fear-based. If you're following, you're cautious. Oh, brother, we need to wait and see. I need to pray. That our prayer room is our cop-out room. We're not waiting to hear. We're, we're finding a place to hide. We're cautious. But leading is courage. The very first encounter with this woman was her outspokenness and gave me her opinion of what she thought about what was that. I thought, hmm, I can live with this lady. She was in my life group the, the, the other day when we got together. Oh, my goodness. I said to Thea, Thea has a wonderful sense of humor. And I said, but according to me, you look depressed because this woman is like crazy. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean it that way. She, I mean, she was the life. She, she, she got us talking. She got us going. She really initiated. So she is in the right place. She is a leader. There you go. <laughs> uh, moving on. We'll leave the back bench now. We always get the people at the back sitting in the grandstands, being the experts, telling us how the game should be played. <laughs> and so if you are a victim, you are hopeless. You are helpless if you're a follower, but you are hopeful if you're leading. And so, you know, one of the things that when I say to people, can I make you angry? Then they say, yes. Then I say, that means I've removed your choice. How do you feel about your choice being removed? No, I'm not happy about that. So why have you given away your choice by blaming me for making you angry? That's how successful this thing is. So victims are, or wallowers are hopeless. Followers are helpless. Leading are hopeful. Wallowers resist change. They rationalize, yes, but... This is Trisha's go-to. I said to her, so where do you think I wallow? When I bring something, yes, but, then I realize, but why it also says, yes, but. So it's obviously a family thing. So wallowers resist change. Followers watch change. Leaders lead change. And so wallowers are reactive. All reactively is fear-based and all reactions destroy creativity. Followers are passive. They're waiting. Leaders are proactive. Wallowers make excuses. Followers just go along. And so whoever influences them the best, they'll get on the better bus or the better bus. And leading gets results. Wallowers have impossibility thinking. Follows, it may work. But I, I remember coming to George and meeting with a couple of locals. And we were sitting around, it was BC days, and uh, at that stage my business was called the Royal Hotel. And we were sitting around, and, and because I wasn't led by the Spirit, I was led by another Spirit in those days. And we were sitting around, and, I said, and, the, and, the, and the locals said to me, you know what happened? Eh? I said, no, I don't know. It was all in Afrikaans. And they said, the whole town decided they would wait and see whether you lost it. And if you lost it, then we would support you. Follow us. It was a mindset in the town. So, uh, followers make excuses. Uh, followers go along. Leaders get results. Followers 
uh, have impossibility thinking. Followers have probability thinking. Leaders have possibility thinking. Complaining, uh, wallowers, complaining about what happened. Listen to your stories. Are all of your stories about yesterday? <clears throat> like for me, I haven't been to Zambia for a couple of months. My stories are stale. I need to go again. I need new stories. I'm starting to become a wallower. Complaining is about what happened. Followers are watching it happen. But leaders are making it happen. Wallows start losing perspective. Followers look for perspective. But leaders shape perspectives. And so what I'm hoping to do today, working through Romans 12 verse 1 and 2, I beseech you, my brethren, that by the mercies of God, you would present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That you would no longer be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove the perfect will of God for your life. Amen? Why don't you give them a round of applause? Please? Thank you. Pardon? You can leave it here. We're going to have, we're going to have prayer sessions now. People will sit where they need their hands laid on them. And so if you, if you come and sit in this chair, that's why I let Dion give up first, we'd probably drive demons out of you because you've got the wrong friends. Let's move on. Time's up. Would you stand with me, please? I don't care where you found yourself this morning. Why not? Because the Bible says, when you were dead in your transgressions and sins, God made you alive by loving you with his great love. So I'd like you to lift up your head to heaven, unashamedly if you're born again, unashamedly, because Christ was punished with your shame so that you could be accepted. Look to heaven. Father, pray with me. Father, right now, I invite your love and your truth that is in Christ and speak to me now. You need to listen to what you heard. Many times, a thought will come to your mind that accuses you. What really fools us is when the question comes, when it comes to you in a question, but it's not a question, it's an accusation. And so I'm not God. I don't know what's happening in the room. But right now, we're going to take authority over the accuser of the brethren. How many of you feel we need to take authority over the accuser of the brethren? And so pray with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that through Jesus Christ, you've reconciled me to yourself. Because you have reconciled me through the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ has cleansed me and washed me. The blood of Christ rebukes the accuser of the brethren in my life. And I take responsibility for my life. By saying, Satan, I reject the lies and the negative emotions that I have believed and accepted from you. Right now, in the name of Jesus and the power of his blood, the blood of Jesus rebukes the accuser in my life. And I command you to go in the name of Jesus Christ. No more will you speak to me. No more will you remind me. No more will you enforce the victimization mindset in me. I am not a victim. I am an overcomer because Christ has overcome the world for me. Christ has overcome for me 
and help me to become an overcomer because Jesus Christ is my Lord and the truth is in Jesus, not in my victimization. I invite your love and your truth. Speak to me now. The Bible says present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Part of your body is your mouth. If this is you, pray with me. Heavenly Father, I sin against you and you alone. I repent for allowing my mouth to be used to accuse you, to accuse myself, and to accuse others. I cancel the authority and the power that I have given to the enemy by allowing him, by giving myself into him and allowing him to use my mouth against God, against myself, and against others. Your kindness brings me to repentance. So because of your kindness, I repent as I find my satisfaction and my enjoyment in Christ and not in my old life because the truth is in Christ. I repent, ask you to forgive me, wash me with the blood of Jesus, cleanse me, and that by the work of the Holy Spirit, Christ would be formed in me. Thank you, Lord, that I divorce myself from the spirit of complaining. I divorce myself and close the door to the destroyer. The destroyer will no longer have legal right in my life. I say to you, destroyer, I cancel the authority and the power that I have given to you through my mouth. But in the name of Jesus, I say go. And so Holy Spirit, Spirit of the living Christ, as I invite the love and the truth, help me to experience that I'm accepted in the beloved. Receive the love. I'm accepted in the beloved. You need to accept it. That he's made you the beloved through Christ. Receive it, receive it, receive it in Jesus' name. And then Ephesians says that it would be to the praise of his glorious grace.